Good evening, sir. Yo, yo. This is episode 89 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast with your host, Brett and CH. Today's topics, Bitcoin, our our good friend Bitcoin hit 9,000 overnight. What was that, last night? Yeah, last night. Um, and, uh, you know, that's big news. I, I feel like that's uh, definitely worth talking about at the end here, considering we recorded a day or two before that. And I don't know that that had crossed our minds at the time. So it's really interesting to uh, to see how quickly things can change. Uh, and two other topics, both related to currency crisis. Um, the first is Lebanon's been dealing with inflation, uh, severe inflation. I guess over the last year or so, and it really picked up just in the last week, and it's led to um, some protesting and things like that. So I think that's important to cover. And then there was a, a recent article from Reuters talking about um, what a new super sovereign currency looks like. And the president of the Shanghai Gold Exchange uh, is making the argument for why don't we have a neutral uh reserve currency that anybody can use and i think that is just um so timely considering uh, everybody's dealing with the same issue people are de-dollarizing and everyone is starting to question which reserve currency or the current reserve currency the us dollar does that really survive into the future maybe measuring that in years or decades and it's hard to say but yeah man it's been like a couple days since we last spoke <sighs> What's been going on? Uh, we're up. I, we, well, we went up over like fifteen hundred dollars from my last recording. We went to ninety five hundred. Um, other than that, it seems like with each passing day that uh, coronavirus is not as serious as we were once told. And yeah, I I'm I will say that I was really concerned in January and February, but as March progressed, uh, especially April more than anything, um, I started to get less concerned just because the fact that like the like million deaths that we're supposed to have in the U.S. aren't happening. And now it seems like all these, you know, hospitals are incentivized to write deaths off as coronavirus or caught by D19 to be correct, because they get a lot more funding. It's like really that simple. It's pretty sad, but that's where we're at. Yeah, the, uh, it's amazing how the incentive change can um, really start to skew results. Um, but I agree with you. I think we were on top of it early on, definitely more concerned than I am right now. And I think that makes sense, right? The earlier you're concerned about something, the quicker you kind of get over it and yeah. everybody else is um, playing catch up here. So I don't know, give it another couple more weeks and maybe everybody who's super concerned right now will start to have a change of tune. But yeah. uh, that's that's to be expected. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, man, let's jump into this uh, Lebanese currency crisis here. And you know, you and I have been sending these videos back and forth of just protesters throwing Molotov cocktails into banks. Uh, I heard multiple bank branches were set on fire. ATM machines were getting broken into. And this was seems to be as a response to uh, the recent inflation that uh, their currency has seen, which. I mean, that sucks, right? And, you know, you and I are blessed enough to live in the United States where you haven't had to deal with a very rapid devaluing of your currency, where overnight, all of a sudden, your bank account can buy half as much stuff as it could the day before. Uh, don't get me wrong, we've certainly dealt with uh, a currency that's been devalued over the over the last few decades, but I guess as long as it's um, being devalued slowly enough, people don't people don't throw Molotov cocktails into banks, which, you know, it just goes to show you how much money really matters. Uh, The Lebanese government also defaulted on their debt, which is around $30 billion worth of euro bonds. And um, surely they they reached out to the IMF for assistance to uh, to save them print turn on the printing press and give them some money uh you know and banks are doing whatever they can right now to try to keep that currency peg and you and i had mentioned briefly you know pegs never last right and they can last for a day a week a month they can last for decades but they inevitably break because it's you can't just fix something and and cross your fingers and hope that it works and as and right now they're doing everything that they can to put currency controls in place, limit people from taking money out of their banks, limit people from taking dollars out of the bank, right? Because nobody wants to hold their shitty domestic currency if they can hold dollars at this point. So, uh, 
Um, yeah. Are, are you surprised to, to see this start happening in certain places around the world? Not at all. I mean, I think we're what we're seeing. Um, and I think, I don't know if we talked about it on the last podcast, or, um, but I know we've discussed it before. Um, basically is what we're seeing. You know, obviously all fiat currencies are in free fall, but um, the way to look at it is like, they don't, they're not going to all go at the same time. You're not like we saw with Argentina, like last, it wasn't that long ago, what in the last year and same with Venezuela, those, you know, started to really hyperinflate in the last few years. And it's been going on for a while with Venezuela. But the point is, it's like, it happens at different times. And we forget like these great time expanses. Like when we think about things that happened, even like with, I like to always reference the post-World War I uh, Europe scene. And when you look at what happened with Austria initially, Austria experienced extreme hyperinflation first before Germany did. Like for instance, a German could go over the border and get six beer, six liters of beer for what one liter of beer costs in Germany. And that, and you know, they thought they had it great. And then obviously it was only less than a year later that Germany experienced full on hyperinflation, even though their currency was inflating, it wasn't inflating as much as Austria. Um, then getting back to this with Lebanon, for instance, this is just another country we're seeing another third world country, I'll say. Um, not that saying Lebanon is not beautiful. I am Lebanese actually. So I'm making fun of myself, but getting back to the point, um, I think we're going to continue to see shitty, like when I mean shitty fiat currencies, like just the, the, the shit of the shit. Like I think even Hong Kong HKUSD peg had to be broken finally. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that was discussion recently. And uh, basically we're going to start seeing all these really shit, shit coins, you know, start to collapse under the weight of the stronger ones, which you can say the dollar obviously is the strongest one right now because it is the world reserve currency. But then, you know, I say in quotation marks, the other strong ones, you know, would be considered, I guess, the euro, which is obviously a shit show, but then you have the British pound, the yen, um, you know, and the Swiss franc. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, but this decade could just be 10 years worth of just, you know, basically countries following each other into hyperinflation, you know, one after another. Um, And obviously, like people like you and I could benefit from this because we might be able to travel places for really, really, really cheap while our U.S. dollars hold up against, you know, their currencies falling. No, I think that's a really good point um, to bring up that it can happen in stages where you're seeing country by country, those that have the weakest currency end up inflating first. And at this point, you'd expect the dollar to inflate last, relatively speaking, right? All the other currencies are um, devaluing quicker than the dollar, and you have this demand and flock to dollars since it's the most stable fiat currency, right? Um, and I think that makes sense. And it it actually makes me a little bullish and makes me less worried because if you think about like the Jesse Colombo model of the everything bubble like everything globally is just in these little bubbles and it's pockets of bubbles in each um, various sector created by credit expansion from the central banks uh, across the globe you can almost let each currency or bubble pop in its own time frame whereas it doesn't have to pop all at once right or you can let these things sort of deflate um, at their own um in their own timing, right? Not everything needs to pop or deflate all at once. And I think that's a good thing because it will lead to much less chaos than the entire global economy just collapsing overnight and every bubble pops at the same time. Uh, I think it's in central bank's best interest to manage the popping of various bubbles so that one doesn't necessarily burst at the same time as another. Um, and it, it, it makes perfect sense that these weak currencies are kind of inflating first. Uh, that totally makes sense to me. Yeah, no, it's like, you know, countries that are struggling, like Venezuela is a perfect example, a country that's struggling and just printing, trying to solve its issues by just printing more money, obviously completely flopped. Um, and I know you mentioned this earlier, this isn't our topic, but you mentioned the two-month stick, and I forgot the two-month close on the NASDAQ and all the other things, too, on Bitcoin you're talking about. We were talking about that earlier before we started. Like, Bitcoin's two-month closes in nine minutes. It's this just giant pin bar. Wow. Yeah. That'd be really funny if it completely dogey completely flat. 
Yeah, I mean, nothing uh, nothing surprises me anymore with Bitcoin, and I guess we'll get into that kind of at the as the last topic. Yeah. But um, the you know, kind of transitioning from one topic to the next. When you think about um, Venezuela has already suffered from hyperinflation. Lebanon's now suffering from significant inflation. Argentina has been suffering from inflation. Iran's been suffering from inflation. Now you're seeing. So what does that mean, right? What's the next logical step of the weakest fiat currencies starting to inflate um, relative to others? And uh, the president of the Shanghai Gold Exchange had is basically making his point that he's calling for a new super sovereign currency to offset the global dom- dominance of the U.S. dollar, which – uh, if you're any other country besides the U.S. dollar, you would want a more neutral system where you don't have to rely on uh, the dollar because it can be weaponized against you at any time, right? If you're a part of the global financial system, you're you're dealing with dollars at the end of the day, or at least settling in them. And if you get, you know, kicked off of the SWIFT network or any other standard, you're pretty much fucked. Like there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. And, you know, he, he did a good job. He expressed his concerns over, okay, now you have unlimited QE that's been mentioned, cutting of interest rates to zero. We haven't gone negative just yet all across the yield curve, but, you know, that could come at any time. So what does that really mean for the dollar, right? How much weaker is the dollar getting? And he had um, two really good quotes here that I want to mention, and then I want want to hear your take on this. But he said, Future global trade needs a super sovereign currency system under which no single country has the power to freeze the international assets of another country. The currency the world ultimately chooses for global trade must not be one that gives someone privilege while exposing others to insecurity. What do you think about that? Um, no, I, I, I agree with what he says. I mean, we've, and I am a U.S. citizen, so I benefit from the U.S. dollar being reserve currency. And it being, it is an economic uh, weapon. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a war, it's a weapon, economic weapon of warfare. That's uh, how the U.S. is. I mean, we can crush another nation simply just via sanctions. Because we, and because, and you say, how do you do that? Well, because when you do like an international wire, if you try to wire from Brazil to India, I like to always use this example. It has to like, I think it's like ninety nine point some percent go through the um, New York Fed. So it has to get approved by them, so they can just block you if they want. Um, you know, and obviously. We can easily say what solves that. Bitcoin's one of those things because Bitcoin allows you to send. It's a you know transfer value um, over the me- medium of which is the internet. And I guess you theoretically don't need the internet if you want to use Andreas Antonopoulos' example. But the internet, more or less, is the best way to put it. it allows you to send value over the internet anytime, anywhere, um, and there are no holidays. And it's pretty straightforward like that. And that definitely throws a curveball. And as uh, what Brad Sherman of uh, California, right? Democratic, yeah, yeah, representative. Um, it is senator or representative. I think representative. He mentioned it. It it's a direct threat to the U.S. Uh, dollar hegemony. Yeah, I mean, he uh, he understands the concept of cryptocurrency. Was that, perfectly. A, was that a sports car? Sorry. Yeah, it was definitely something <laughs> Sorry. expensive that flew something by expensive. my window. <laughs> I just heard um, this. Th- <laughs> but uh yeah i mean it, you make a good point and i you know i'm reading this and it it screams something like bitcoin to me right it's like super sovereign currency something that's neutral something that n- any single country doesn't have the power to freeze um it, and you think about just that you know bitcoin's a a, a neutral tool right it's a, it's a neutral tool that if when i'm taking a a step back and trying to think about it a little bit more um, if it's this global settlement layer something where you can work around whether it be sanctions or anything else um, you know it is as of right now the only way to send value over a communications channel that's that's its differentiating factor compared to any other competing money um, and it, its digital nature is a benefit because you can do that but then it's also digital and not physical. So you get the, all the cons that come with something being um, purely digital. So I think when I was reading this, you know, clearly it would be if countries were to try to band together and say, okay, what's, what can we do? Your default option would be, well, you know, 
what if we went back to some sort of gold standard? I think it's difficult to pull off, but at the same time, I think um, Bitcoin's too small still. And you know, I'm kind of it's getting this info so from- so small compared to everything. We, when right. Lawrence Leppard talked about in our podcast, like even gold relative to what all like the equity values around the globe is a it's fraction. Small, right. And same with silver, it's a fraction. You know, and it'll be interesting as we talk about if if that value in this next decade, it might not even be a decade. It might be only, you know only three or four years, depending on you know how quickly things go one way or another. Um, is you know does it all that value shift into um, you know into hard assets for say I'll say gold, silver, platinum, Bitcoin, etc. Um, I don't know. That's it. I would like to think so. I would, you know, history tends to repeat itself, and um, it's becoming more clear through the past decade. You know, perfect example is Russia and China have done nothing but buy gold for a decade just to up their position, and I think they know it's it's a long game. They're not dumb. You know, they don't you don't buy gold because you're hoping for tomorrow to go to fucking you know eighteen hundred dollars instead of being at seventeen hundred or whatever it was at the close today. You're buying it because. You're waiting for the day when everyone's fiat currency becomes worthless, and you hopefully have just as much gold as other countries, so you can swing around, you know, your dick per se, you right. know, with other countries. That's 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 the goal. You know, you don't want to be, for instance, China was it? If, and I could be wrong with this, but it was like the late 1800s. China got screwed because they had a bunch of silver but didn't have much gold, and right. the whole world basically operated on the British pound's gold standard, basically. Yeah, I think Safe Dean had, had talked about that in mm -hmm. the Bitcoin standard and how, you know, even if you, you choose a, a decent money, if everyone else chooses, um, for lack of a better term, the best money, you can really be left behind. And that had devastating effects on um, China in this example. So it, it, I was listening to um, Ansel Linder on a, on another podcast, and he's the host of the Bitcoin and Markets podcast, which is actually pretty good. They're like pretty short and quick, easy to listen to, um, and you know, it, he was just making the point that you know, within the next five to ten years, you're going to see um, some sort of new uh, super sovereign currency. But what does that really look like? Because as of today, gold, silver, Bitcoin. It, it, how do you even pull it off, right? How does everybody switch to a new system? It just seems almost impossible. And the point that he was trying to make was the only thing you could do to stay on a dollar standard is for deflation. Like you need to, you need that credit contraction and um, the debt to not a debt jubilee, but if the value of all these asset prices that have been inflated because of credit expansion come back down, at least you can give your buy yourself a little bit more time before a new system, whatever that may be. Uh, that you can actually transition to that. Right now, there's just nothing to transition to because Bitcoin's too small. Uh, there's not enough. Of, what are you going to do with gold and silver? Like, how do you even set that up to get started? And you know, the dollar's still dominant. So it's like his thoughts are: you have to deflate to in, in order to just simply move forward. Yeah, that, that's. I mean, I mean, how would you even exchange? You know, for let's say. What would a I'm just using this as an example hypothetical. What would one U.S. dollar U.S. gold dollar equal? You know, what, what does that equal? You know, per right. se, like how does that equate to the Can current? Come up fiat? with a peg. Yeah, what's what's the peg? Is it you know what's the exchange rate? Is the exchange rate you know, uh, one gold dollar for every hundred U.S. dollars? You know, like you'd be pretty sad if you had a million dollars and all of a sudden that becomes you know a thousand dollars or something like that, or ten thousand dollars would be the correct. You know what I mean? And you know, ten thousand your, your million fiat goes to ten thousand gold dollars. Now you feel worthless. Uh, it's like I, you know, it's a really tough one. And that deflation, it's a great point. There's so much debt, and there's so much. Everything's priced in dollars. All this debt and all these assets. When you look at stocks, it's like, you know, the only answer, the only way out of this is things have to deflate eventually. And as Lawrence Leppard had mentioned on our podcast, uh, you know. In 2008, they had a chance because of the, the complete deflation we had across all asset classes. Now, granted, the pain, it would have been more painful and it would have taken time, but it would have set us up on the right path going forward, having right. you know a sound money instead of just increase the credit expansion and print more money. Now, granted, uh, you can give them quite a hand. I mean, they've done it for a decade, you know, actually not even a decade. It's been really 11 years now. Um, right. It's pretty incredible. And as you and I both know, these things can't go on forever. At some point... Um, you know, something, it's a wake up call. And I think this whole 
COVID-y, fake pandemic, whatever you want to call it, coronavirus, uh, was it just a, a good wake-up call that how fragile, not just the financial system, but our whole society is globally, how we're so interconnected that just a simple, slight disruption. And I mean, I get coronavirus is bad, but like, like, how would this world deal with like an actual world war with real death? I mean, like, I get people are dying from coronavirus; it's bad, but it, it, there's there's been a financial incentive to write, as I mentioned at the start of the podcast, to write these off as deaths, um, as COVID because it's you get paid more. It's really that simple, and it's not even close. I think the payments it's, it's a complete difference, like hundreds it's of like percent. Forty thousand dollars. Yeah, or it's, something. yeah, forty k yeah. versus like a thousand dollars. It's not even. A, why would you not write everyone off? You could someone could get shot. Call by D19. <laughs> it's right. like, why not? 40K, boom. But um, no, it, it, like I couldn't imagine if there's, you know, if there was an actual real world war and you talk about supply chains completely breaking down every country, nationalizing every industry and people actually dying. I don't know. And like, cause as bad as this was, I th- I think we're really beginning to realize this wasn't that bad. This is almost like planned implosion of the, the global economy. I mean, yeah, no, on one hand, you know, uh, the fear factor was definitely high. And now, depending upon what angle you're looking at, you are less afraid. But then also, and I know we've talked about this before, was the the response once everybody was on the same page about being afraid of coronavirus, that fear, how how quickly people were willing to kind of give up their rights. um, Yeah. Like just all this stuff where you're like, well, hold on a second. Everybody was telling me this was a no big deal. It was no big deal in yeah, January mass, or beginning of not February. Even, dude, it was it was March, like first week of March. People were saying masks were important, and this, you know, and like the Blasio of New York City was telling people to still go out. And then a week right. later, and 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 then so perfect example is uh, they canceled the New York primary in like the end of June or first week of August or July, excuse me. Uh, for the Democratic primary, and I'm like, I'm like, how could you cancel? It's eight weeks away. Eight weeks ago, they were telling us not to wear a mask, and now that now that you know, you can get arrested for not wearing a mask, if, depending on where you are. So it's like, you know, I don't know what's going on, in a sense, but clearly the people who are supposed to be leaders or whatever government, have completely botched whatever this was, and you know, were wrong to begin with, and then completely overreacted. And now, you know, people got to realize, especially in America, the people, us 330 million, some people are a lot stronger than the government officials. And like a whole, like a perfect example is that, uh, I don't know if you saw that video, I think I sent it to you of that, the police officers arrested that mom, like, you know, with her kids at the playground yeah. and, and, the, and all the neighbor, you know, the people, the community did was they showed up at that police officer's house and stood outside and told, you know, and there was like probably 50 or 60 of people there protesting. And all it was, was just showing you know, the guy basically said it's just a reminder that you serve us and not the other way around. And I think that's just a good reminder. No, it's a great reminder. And um, I'm hopeful that this ends up being more of a wake up call to uh, not let that type of behavior happen where you're just so willing to give up all of your rights, essentially, for something that you didn't care about six or eight weeks ago to now you really care about it. You know, it, it it's a little scary, but at the same time, I don't want to see um, these kinds of events used um, or weaponized, I guess, in a sense where it can um, take away people's r- rights or um, make them do something they wouldn't have done otherwise, which is which is the, um, the scary part. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's um, 9K. Is it, yeah, nine, is yeah. it 9K time? Yeah, I mean, you know... <laughs> As, as much as I do and don't like talking about price on the podcast, um, it's I, the only reason I wanted to bring this one up was because we literally recorded right before the pump. I mean, it was maybe, I don't know, at 7,500 bucks and we were excited for the next day to see what was going to happen. Like it felt like we were going to go one way or another sometime soon. And then, you know, we record, I didn't drop the episode until yesterday and uh, I had put in my story, you know, enjoy listening to two people talk about Bitcoin the day before the pump, right? Like the, the two people who just had no clue what was coming the next day. And, uh, I think that's, 
it's fun to listen to, right? You can, you can really hear what people are thinking at that time prior to, you know, blast off or however you want to call it. And, uh, yeah, you know, the big pimpin' meme was dropped. Everybody loved it. Then I got DMs to post the one for 9K. <laughs> um, it, you know, and that's usually a good counter indicator that we've gone too high, too gone fast. Too, too high, too fast. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and, and and it's um, it, it's good, though, because I think it's it's important to, like, to post it. And it's important to remind everybody what usually happens when it's being posted all the time, very frequently, uh, you know, twice in one day Volatility. type stuff. That means we're, we're really Volatility moving. Volatility goes both ways. I, I remember there was a, and I think we meant, we talked about a while ago. There was, there was a long time where we did, you didn't post any because you're just like, every time I post it, it fucking marks the top. <laughs> yeah. You almost, you don't want to be the like CNBC counter indicator. I'm trying to, not to do that. <laughs> You should post the opposite now. You should post every bottom. Like it just, you should like flip it, <laughs> like invert yeah. the meme. I don't know something like that. Every I'll time, to, every dip would get in Bitcoin. I'll have to think of something. But yeah, um, you know, something. It, this is a good point to remind everybody how how much how emotional Bitcoin is, how much price absolutely drives adoption, um, and. You know, nobody cared even three days ago. And now, I mean, I've had coworkers telling me that their friends are asking them questions because they're, they know a tiny bit about Bitcoin and they need help. We've seen exchange signups going through the roof. Um, Swan Bitcoin, which they allow you to like do a dollar cost average with really low fees. They're seeing like an explosion in new signups and volume. So it, it, sometimes it takes that, that pump for oh yeah and we have swan bitcoin yeah i just i i never looked at it before so i was just I yeah it. I, i'm actually in a couple of uh build your uh, stack yeah i'm in a couple of telegram groups with with these guys really good team over at swan so i definitely recommend you know if if your narrative is switching from bitcoin being you know, for lack of a better term, a savings technology, something that you just want to say, eh, I'm going to throw a couple of bucks a week in and I'm just going to do that as my, you know, X percentage of what you earn on a monthly basis to just put that away and save it for, uh, for a couple of years. I think this is definitely way, the way to go because you um, it's it's a no brainer automates the, de the dollar cost average function and um, it prevents you from doing anything too crazy if you're trying to time the market and stuff like that which you know i'm probably the worst trader on the planet and ever since i stopped trading um i've i've made way more money so i think it's uh it's a good thing uh for at least for me but for anybody else out there thinking about bitcoin as a savings technology uh you know the maybe dollar cost average is the way to go and you can see the difference in fees here is pretty substantial compared to you know, using Coinbase as your, as your exchange, or even um, even Cash App's a little bit more expensive. And uh, you know, I yeah, I was curious wrong, how I they like made. Cash App. I was curious. That's why I wanted to look at the FAQ because I figured they had something with their fees. Because I was like, the, I was like, that's how they have to make their money is some kind of fee system. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, if you look at that, even you know, it says you know fifty bucks a week. It's going to cost you one point one nine percent if you're paying as you go. And if you're the kind of person who's buying fifty bucks a week worth of Bitcoin as your little savings account, um, you know that it, it's a it's a great way to do it. And I don't think it's um, I don't think it's weird that all of a sudden there's an explosion of people signing up for this kind of stuff or looking for more ways to invest or get exposure to Bitcoin as l almost instantly as soon as the price pumped. I mean, it's it it just really goes to show you how um, how much price drives adoption. No, it, it price does drive adoption. We, we talk about it, but it's like everything. It's like it, Tesla is the perfect example. Tesla, everyone all of a sudden became you know Tesla holders after Tesla went from 180 to 1,000 or 950. I mean, and we look at Tilray. I knew someone who fucking put a lot of money in Tilray. God knows what price. And Tilray, it, I don't know if it was in the 200s or whatever, but Tilray is like trading at single digits now. Um, and again, people, and oil, oil going negative. People, everyone decided to become an oil trader and buy a USO. I, I, I still can't get over the, I, I know I mentioned it on the last podcast, but I just, I can't believe how many people that have never traded once in their life decided to trade oil the oil i've traded before it's a fucking hard thing to trade and i'm not good at trading i have experience now but like 
I don't know why everyone decided to become an oil trader all of a sudden. They've never traded anything in their life, and they decided to all go buy a USO, not looking into the prospectus, not understanding that USO doesn't track oil exactly, and now we have a bunch of bag holders. Like I had at least a handful of people tell me they bought calls on USO. Calls. <laughs> Dude, look, I was like, not only are you just buying an ETF that might not exist in a few weeks or days, you're buying options. <laughs> right. Maximum leverage. I was like, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it, 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 it's insane. And it's um, even I think um, the quote the Raven guy had said, you know, all of a sudden everybody's a gold investor if gold goes to 2000. And it's, oh, yeah, it's, 100%. A, it, it's a good point because just like we've been saying this for the last 18 months, you know, the the day that Bitcoin goes back above 20K, that first print above 20K, all of a sudden, oh, it didn't die again. It's it's not a scam or a Ponzi scheme, and everybody is going to get back into it. Even the people that don't invest whatsoever at all will, you know, they're going to buy some just because, right? Because the number went up enough. And the same thing happened in 2017. If you can see the screen there, when that first move um, back above, I don't know, 1200 bucks, um, everybody started to pile in. You saw Coinbase signups going crazy, um, all that stuff that we went through in the spring of 2017. And, you know, now it's like, okay, well, are we getting back to that point again? The halvings in less than two weeks? Um, will the, the, the decrease in available supply that's for sale um, make a difference? And will that pump the price uh is everyone excited that bitcoin didn't die when it dropped to 3800 just what like five or six weeks ago during that flash crash when every though everything on the planet sold off yeah uh you know like was that really the bottom uh you know it, it's impossible to tell but you had a lot of movement here what are we uh, we're up what uh, almost 150 percent from peak to trough yeah, I mean that's that's a lot of that's a lot of movement, and you don't wonder if the 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 crowd is thinking, okay, do I need to get my position here before it it really takes off, or you know, are we going back to 4K again or whatever? I, I think enough people woke up in this last couple of weeks here that they're going to start thinking about whether or not they're going to actually take a position this time around, um, at least before new all-time highs right there's there's a there's a group of people who won't touch this until it breaks new all-time highs and they're convinced that it's not going to die and then there's a other group of people who maybe thought about it in 2017 and hesitated and uh now they're starting to look at it because people are talking about it again and you know my my buddy from work he he has a little you know a group of uh, people at investors that he talks with and they're all in the real estate side and it's interesting to see a hard asset group of investors start looking at it i because i i think people are starting to now see the overlap between you know gold real estate um, bitcoin i guess the difference between real estate and gold and bitcoin is one's a cash flow producing asset and the other two aren't but the i, I i'm going to use the word physical here but the physical nature of real estate gold and the let's say um digital scarcity um nature of Bitcoin, it, they are a little similar in certain ways. And it's interesting that they're the same people are becoming interested in them. Yeah, no, it's it, it's slowly over time. And I've seen it with people too, who've come to accept that Bitcoin's here to stay. You know, they, I think a lot of people thought, you know, it, it's always funny watching people think something's going to go to zero. I'm guilty of it. I thought Tesla would be dead. I wanted to be dead. And not that, I'd, you know what, I will give Elon this, this is a little topic. I will give Elon this. He is uh, I don't agree with him a lot, but he has been right about trying to open up shit again because yeah. we can't – if we – if most of America stays close for another two weeks, um, nothing really will matter to be honest or for the rest of the world too. I mean no amount of gold, real estate, Bitcoin, silver, stocks will matter if we stay shut down. I sent you that tweet earlier from uh, Joe007, one of the Bitcoin whales about like – you know, no amount of money printing is going to solve the lack of human productivity we've had for a fucking month. Right. I mean, you know, people aren't producing shit. People aren't going out. People aren't buying shit. You know, I'm not talking to consumer. People just need to build shit, do shit. And it's not happening. And that's, I know it's very generic saying go do shit. But like people who work in factories who build cars, people who build laptops, people who build microphones, you know, um, you name it. And it's like the law, you know, we, 
at some point, it, as it becomes more abundantly clear that this isn't a pandemic and we need to open up, it has to happen. And I think, you know, every ticking day is another small business because I've known a few people have died from this. It's sad. But at the same time, I know a lot of um, struggling small business owners. And I'm a young guy and I know, you know, I just know people who are a little older than me that own small businesses and they're struggling. And I've mentioned before, like a lot of like martial arts is a perfect example, like uh, small jujitsu dojos are getting crushed by this because they live you know, basically month to month on, you know, because they lease out a place or space that they have, you know, probably already pretty high expenses, you know, and so, you, and then once you take away the revenue stream for two months, boom, you're screwed. Or you just have all your students drop, you know, because they can't afford it. And that's just me using an example I personally know, but there's plenty of other examples. There's so many mom and pop shops, restaurants, etc. They're getting crushed by this. Yeah, I think that's um, underappreciated and underestimated how many small businesses are really going to get crushed um, because of because of the shutdown. And it's the reality is, as many of the large companies that we have in the United States, the small businesses really are the driving force and the lifeblood of every every town, every city. I mean, they, they really do keep things going. And it's it's going to be a shame to watch many of them either not be able to get their small business loan to keep the the doors closed and then reopen them when they're allowed to reopen them. Uh, And, you know, you might even see uh, in the next couple of weeks, certain small business owners just say, you know, fuck it, we're going to open up and you cross your fingers and hope you don't get shut down. I mean, because of the the reality is you need to survive. Right. And you just. You, you can't stay closed forever unless um, cr- money will be printed or credit will be expanded and given directly to you so you can keep surviving. Other than that, you need to take care of yourself. And uh, since not everybody has land with chicken, cows, and uh, water, like well water, <laughs> you know, all of those services need to be provided by grocery, somebody. Grocery stores. Meat, yeah. meat processing, you know, it's, it's so people, we don't think about all these supply chain things, but like they're really important and like it can only be shut down so long. And the same thing I, I know I've mentioned this on this podcast before, like the trucking industry in America, if the trucking industry shut down for a week, we would be, we'd be screwed. There'd be anarchy in America because grocery stores usually have about three days of food roughly. Um, and they're obviously, you know, day in, day out, those, you know, your Publix, your Kroger's, your Albertsons, et cetera, is restocked, you know, by numerous different trucks bringing in, you know, meats, fruits, vegetables, frozen food, packaged food, water, et cetera, you name it. It is, they're bringing in goods and it, it's, it's really worrisome that, you know, if like, um, that whole beef thing, you know, if, if, if you know, beef, if beef production is shut down completely, we are looking at serious issues in the U.S. And I think someone mentioned it perfectly. I sent you that, um, what was that, that guy's clip at that rancher in Texas, North Texas or whatever. Yeah. That, you know, heavy set dude who was like, we're importing meat from like Africa or something, yet our own, you know, FDA won't let, you know, U.S. farmers, you know, make their own meat or whatever. Or, you know, process. <laughs> yeah, like sell direct to the consumer. Yeah, exactly. Sell direct to the consumer. But we're bringing meat in from fucking third world country, you know, across the Atlantic. <laughs> it's like... It, things have gotten so backwards right now. It's incredible. Um, and I think this is probably just another blow to the system again. Um, and when I mean the system, I'm talking about big government, you know, big brother, etc. I think people really, you know, this time you want to talk about putting the nail, like just the fucking nail, you know, dagger in their heart here. This is it. People are, you know, at their ends with, I think. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a really good point. And um, I know we always like talking about uh, Tom Massey and he uh, how he's, you know, more of your libertarian viewpoint in uh, in government. And he I think he proposed like the Prime Act or something like that, which is essentially to allow um, beef ranchers to provide beef direct to the consumer because he's very concerned about uh, a beef shortage. And I think it's it's so telling that and he made this point he said every time there's a crisis or something like that what what's the government response always to do it's to reduce the amount of regulations and to limit the size of the government in or in order to let the free market kind of act and provide those goods and services quickly and more efficiently and his they always point is like and his point is like we should kind of like if we're going to um, be laxed or more laissez-faire on certain things, like don't go back, leave it there because um, 
you just get this explosion in productivity and the consumers benefit because prices come down, right? It's not like there's a million different hurdles to jump through in order to put ground meat into the grocery store so that a person can go and buy it, right? You just, you remove all that red tape and regulation um, to allow for the economy to flourish. And I hope that, you know, if that happens, people will start thinking about that and apply it to other things like like the production of money for one thing like what if we were more laxed on on those regulations um what what would that do to the economy because if the response is always to um reduce the amount of regulations and everybody benefits why don't we start doing that for more things and i hope people start to see that yeah i i you know i don't think we're we're too far away from that i think more and more people realize you know if we let you know if we let ourselves not self-govern is the way to put it, but I think people are realizing that not, and I, I don't like use the word decentralized, I, but because it's just it's abused too much. But I do like it, you know, whether because I I I like I think it's been abused because of crypto more than anything. But like, uh, I I'm a follower of Jocko Wilnick, and I know you know who he is, but he he likes you know using decentralized command, and I think you know our country could definitely use that form of decentralized command here more than ever. Just being able to just you know, whether, you know, in, in this instance, people, we needed protective, you know, equipment, PPE, let people produce, you know, let the people who can produce face masks at the cheapest price, even though I think face masks are worthless now, because the people who told you not to wear face mask for two months, then waited until the last minute to tell you to wear face mask are going to be wrong in about a month. But again, this is just an example, you know, why not let people just produce face mask and, you know, give it to whoever's the lowest bidder, et cetera. Um, right. And there's just... It, it's interesting because we we're so um it feels like concentrated now you know with our with monopolies and whatnot when you talk about fang facebook amazon apple google or netflix and google and you know all our content you know i mean now the content's more spread out between hulu disney whatever but still it's coming from a big couple corporations and i think the more we decentralize and the same thing with this meat processing thing that was mentioned is spread out like allow people just to sell directly to consumers like i out west when i lived in montana i knew um you know a lot of people that would just buy like you know a uh, husband and wife one of the guys i trained with is a former green beret him and his wife would split like a, a cow with another family and right. that's enough meat for like a whole year you know you just stuff it in the freezer you know you buy yourself and honestly i highly recommend i i uh, my place that lived out west my roommates and i got a uh a chest freezer and that thing is phenomenal it's great you know if you just want to freeze meat freeze goods it's great, and you have that food for a long time. You know, obviously, you need power to keep it cold, but if you have power, hopefully, keep your fingers crossed that we don't lose power because that's very important. That's another point. People, we take so many things for granted, dude. I was taking a hot shower before this podcast. I was like, dude, I take this so for granted. I was like, <laughs> no, like we do though, dude. Like it's like yeah, you, yeah. you take it away for like a week or two, dude. You're like, holy shit. And like one of the books I'm reading right now is about the um, initial special forces, you know, operators in Afghanistan with the CIA, and it's like. They're fucking, you know, they didn't shower for a month, dude. These guys didn't shower for a month. You know, you maybe wash your face with water, no showers, limited, you know, if you had a generator or your compound, that's it. But there's no, there's no electricity in 2001 Afghanistan, you know, uh, and, you know, very, you know, you're um, just like little things, you know, we take for granted. And I just, I, I was thinking about that. earlier. It's like. No, it's a good point. I think the number one thing that everybody takes for granted uh, is that the money still works. And <laughs> like, it still and works. It's, it's it still only works. when we, it's only when we talk about the places where it doesn't work and yeah. what ends up happening. Do I really take a step back? And this is what know, happens why, if you're watching. Th- yeah, yeah, exactly. This is what happens, and it it just, um, it makes me think wh- how. Money is so important, yet so many people are uh, not educated about how money works, what it is, um, why the you know the quantity of monies, and, and when the the quantity gets increased, that can cause issues. I, you know, it's not a coincidence to me anymore that people don't understand that. So you can thank the, I mean, the U.S. education system. I mean, it's a hundred years, yeah, right. hundred plus years of building U.S. ignorance. Yeah, it's um, they build it's, a, good it's, a, it's a it's a shame, especially when you think of I think of the United States of having so many financial gurus and you know all this stuff, and that's the one thing people don't mention is about the money themselves. They might say, oh, you know, uh, 
it, don't worry about your cash put it in hard assets the rich dad poor dad kind of mentality cash flow quadrants all that stuff i mean the lessons are there but i think the thing that they never say is that you wouldn't have to everybody wouldn't have to become a professional investor if money just worked as as it ought to be as it should where it's just this thing that you store your value in and, and nobody would need to be getting exposure to stonks and all this other stuff you'd have your business or your job you'd have your home and your land and then you'd have some money that you could use that doesn't inflate and over you, time and, and it's just so simple but yet people think that it needs to be so complicated in order to work and it's i just think it's dumb now yeah no i was going to say to what to, to what you said was perfect it's like you know why should someone have to risk you know half or more of their life savings in risk investments, AKA stocks, just so they can retire. You know, um, you know, it, that's what, the dilemma a lot of Americans face nowadays, you know, Gen X and baby boomers where it's like, you know, do, you know, do I, do I just keep working until I'm like 75 or 80, you know, because the, the biggest worry for those people is, is, you know, if I retire at 60, am I going to outlive my money? You know, 30 years is a long time. And it's like, how much is, you know, is that, you know, let's say that person saved $2 million, which seems like a lot, but if you spread that out over 30 years, it's not really that much. And then you talk about inflation, you talk about right. unexpected expenses, and there, you know, there you go, boom, it's all gone. Um, right. So it's, it's, it's pretty sad that we've gotten to that point. And as I said, it, it forces people to speculate in risky assets. You know, the central banks, what central banks are doing right now, and I was listening to on Bloomberg perfectly earlier, uh, this woman was talking about it. it was like the the close of the American session or whatever. She was, um, you know, central bank policies are doing the exact opposite of what people need right now, and, and that's savings. You know, she was talking about saving rates had gone up tremendously, which makes sense because people are like, holy shit, everything has stopped. I should have more cash on the sidelines or just stuff to cover right. expenses. And she's like, but central banks are doing the exact opposite. They're they're encouraging people to go, you know, with rates at zero to go, you know, speculate and. Um, you know assets you know and it, it's it's quite incredible to see that happen and hopefully you know it, it's too unfor it, it's too bad or unfortunate that the interest rate is manipulated to the point that you know in like Europe Japan you know a lot of countries their you know their bonds out to 10 15 years are negative you know it's inc it's incredible uh, you know where you don't make money on anything so it makes zero sense and their saving rates are negative why would you keep your money in a bank if you're if you're already losing inflation, why would you leave your money in a bank where you know it makes zero sense? They're leveraging your money and you're and and you're paying them. <laughs> it makes no sense. And and again, this all goes back to education. You know, um, if people even had like a fucking semester class in high school of fucking history of money, even if they had like someone come in, like fuck, I would go do it. I would go fucking go to each fucking high school in the U.S. and go there for a week and talk like each different high school and talk for. A week to each class just fucking talk about history of money and why it's important just to hopefully spark you know a few kids fuses maybe to get them interested and curious into looking into it you know but uh it's unfortunate because you know you know we, we find ourselves in these situations only because people don't study history yeah and you know i, I wanted to um just comment on something that i had mentioned to lawrence leopard when we had interviewed him and it, you know it's a good point right how do you how do you help the next generations learn that um, understanding money and the history of money is so important. And what I told him was, I think if you can make understanding the history of money profitable, it's its own um, like – self-reinforcing mechanism right so if if you if in five years from now all of the hard money people who were talking about gold who were talking about bitcoin all of a sudden become extremely wealthy because those um, assets increased in price you're going to have the next generations point to them and say well wait a second how did those guys know to buy gold in 2016 2017 2013 how did they know to to buy bitcoin then what were they studying and then all of a sudden it births a, a new group of call them hodlers right who are interested in hard money who are interested in um you know increased savings and investment for the future it just the only way you incentivize that is if people can make a lot of money learning about it and studying it right so that light bulb goes off and you don't have to 
you don't have to convince anybody to become a gold bug or, you know, to invest in Bitcoin. If it's always going down, if it's not going up in price, who's going to give a shit? But if number go up, all of a sudden you have that that um, incentive to go and, and learn about it. So I, I hope that that is the way that the lessons get told, right? Because greed, the hu- human greed of wanting more and wanting to earn profit is all the incentive that one needs to, to study this stuff. Yeah, no. Um, again, free market. It's I think that's the basic point of our podcast is the free market is what drives this world, and it's it's the reason that where or the reason why the human race has gotten to where it's gotten. You know, if we had just went strictly socialism in 1850, we would not be where we are now. We would not have the internet. We would not have you know aircraft to the capability we have. You know, planes. You know, cars. You know, you name it. Technologies, GPS. Uh, you name it, flat screen TVs, you know, computers, the list goes on. I mean, um, at the end of the day, if there's an incentive for people to make a good product or a new product or something, then that's all they need. You know, if there's, a, right. I guess, a monetary incentive. But, you know, in the world where it's dominated, for instance, now it feels like harder than ever, you know, if you're, I mean, trying to compete in tech space, I feel like it's impossible now with, you know, what Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, like, how do you compete with them? They own everything, you know, you know, it, right. there's, there's no, there's no point of like no contact with Amazon because they have all the servers, you know, and then Facebook, you know, between Instagram, WhatsApp, etc., they have a lot, you know, yeah. so it's, a, it's an interesting time. And again, we're at the start of this decade and it's, so much shit has happened, but we had the biggest wake up call by far, so we'll see where this leads us to. Yeah, no, I think that was a that was a good way to wrap this one up. This is one of my favorite episodes for sure. Um, you know, this was episode eighty nine. Make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. We appreciate all the all the new YouTube subscribers and all those comments on there. Really do appreciate that. Uh, you can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That would be very helpful. And um, follow us on Spotify also. And make sure to shoot us a DM. Let us know what you want us to talk about. It's really helpful when you guys uh, DM us and engage with us, so we know exactly what you want to hear um so yeah stay safe out there um 2020 has been a wild ride so far and i think it's it's really just going to get more interesting from there here on out yep peace peace